Hi everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm Sankal, and uh, today we have with us Kaushal Ozha ji. He's a national award filmmaker, and uh, yeah, आप सबको शायद पता होगा. Before you have joined that uh, Sunny FTIS, he has graduated, and uh, he has made three films, uh, if I'm not wrong, and uh, two of them have been awarded uh, national awards by the uh, government of India. And uh, his first film was Darshan of Janto in 2010, and second was After Glow, both of which won the national awards. and coming to the coming to the session that we are having today and the name of the session that is mizose so uh, i think everybody pretty much knows that what mizose is but uh, uh, mizose basically is the stage design and arrangement of actors in scenes and in visual design on, in theater and stage and in visual medium so why is it more relevant for us to have a chat with kaushal sir on that is because in his films if you'll watch and if you'll read his interviews uh, he has always mentioned that uh, every aspect of filmmaking is equally important in how the film shapes up and how it is received later so that's all and uh, kaushal sir can we uh, can we start uh, oh will... yeah sankal yeah thank you i'll 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 start we'll start with this session on miso sen i have organized this session in three or four parts Firstly uh, the first part of this session is just an introductory sort of session to know your ideas etc uh, the second uh, part of this session is when we uh, link up to miso sen and uh, understand what are our ideas on miso sen uh, the third part of the session is very break down miso sen into the elements of miso sen and uh, the slides that i have there are empty so i'm not put in anything together all of us will come up with what are the elements of miso sen and put them there uh, finally i have a couple of uh, examples a uh, couple of film scenes to watch and uh, and some examples from uh, from a graphic novel to understand this uh, uh, how miso sen works uh, in graphic novels and what we could uh what we could use from the language of graphic novels and films uh so i'm not switching on my video right now sankal uh the reason being that uh, let's let's first concentrate on the uh on the ppt because i have some images there which i would want people to see and then we do when we do the question answer session i'll switch on the video and maybe if you guys want to you can switch on the video right is sure, that all right sure 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 yeah sure, okay sure. great so a question for you guys uh should our films be as real as possible uh what are your ideas when you when you answer just start with possibly your introduction and what is your exposure to cinema are you a film student are you a practicing filmmaker are you just interested in cinema uh that would be great so this is the question should our films be as real as possible there's no right or wrong answer here i just want to get a discussion started just to know your ideas on uh, how you look at realism in cinema yes prakul go right ahead uh hi then so uh, i am an aspiring filmmaker like i am trying to get into this and uh, what i feel is it depends on the subject you are trying to uh, you know showcase and versus how you want to showcase it so uh, it can be a hyper reality it can be uh, something of fantasy as long as what you are trying to showcase uh, uh is is being portrayed as how uh, say it like uh, it can be a fantasy but uh, uh, you can use that fantasy to tell your message then it's fine with like uh, right some nonsensical thing can also happen uh, as long as you are getting your message across or right. So, yeah. so it depends really on what you are trying to focus. Okay, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. Thank you, Prakul. Uh, VTR. Uh, hi. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, if our film is grounded to an extent, then is when the drama will uh, be uh, as like it will have some tension if the film is grounded. If the film is already at a uh, at a, let's say like let's say if we take a war film then a death won't affect us as much as uh, in a slice of life film so the drama which we have in the plot uh, the rest of the film should not be 
above that or uh, you know let's say take an asgar farhadi film it's it has tension throughout the film mm-hmm. because the world is grounded so much mm-hmm. uh, so that is what i think okay okay fair enough yes yes so what you are trying to say uh, if if i can just sum it up is that our film should be rooted in realism whether or not they are actually real is that what you are trying to say what i'm saying is it depends on the kind of drama that we want to portray if it's a very mm-hmm. high drama uh, then it's okay to be uh, little uh, above than grounded but if the mm-hmm. incidents are less dramatic then it is better to be as grounded as possible so that these less dramatic events feel more dramatic i see okay yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Sham, I, I would definitely think that uh, as a filmmaker, you know, whatever little things that I have done, I always try to um, portray things uh, such that it evokes an emotion. That is how I always look at things. Mm-hmm. Savit. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, good morning. Uh, hey, morning, sir. Uh, th- uh, this is Savit from Hyderabad. I- I'm aspiring filmmaker and I'm a- and I'm a short filmmaker. Uh, just I want to support uh, the previous guy who had spoken that uh, actually the filmmaker should feel the subject right uh, to tell the the intensity of the subject totally lies in the filmmaker and the storyteller uh, the story which he want to pitch. uh for suppose actually uh, in some film making uh, in some films we observe that uh, there is a calculation in writing itself uh, means uh, uh, p- commercial films uh, we we call them uh, they will have their own calculation uh, but few films which we will uh, tell from our core heart it may be fantasy it may be fantasy basically i believe that uh, the two types of films one films will influence the brain and other films will touch our heart Uh, so for example if we take a thriller uh, for suppose uh, thrillers will uh, will majorly play the mind games uh, rather than uh, emotional films uh, the, uh, these films majorly deal about the feel of us so uh, my word is uh, as a film maker we will also have that urge to tell the story right uh, mm-hmm. to say the film i want to tell this story to the audience uh, mm-hmm. so i think it will be the major part uh, while we are selecting the story or impacting the audience the emotion which we feel uh, Mm. which we give to the audience uh, that mm. 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 okay great sir so great we have had some ideas on should our films be real so uh, so park those thoughts uh, i have an image for you so can someone uh, look at this image and uh, and tell me what what are the emotions that it is evoking if if any uh what do you what do you feel like uh when you when you watch this image uh what is your reaction to it yes we can uh so this image is giving me a romanticized uh life kind of a view i mean uh life uh, is meant to be enjoyed and uh you know the ye jawani hai diwani uh, kind of a theme this is what mm-hmm. this image is conveying what what it, are the what are the elements that are that are evoking that the feeling? the the yellow light uh, the yellow light which is in contrast to the blue uh, these colors uh, i usually associate yellow with art mm-hmm. and uh, uh, vibrance in life as supposed to dull colors like brown and mud uh, mm-hmm. so i think the colors and the light Uh, as well as the setting uh, the mm-hmm. cafe the open air cafe which is it, uh, it is set in uh, mm-hmm. these are the things that evoking that kind of an impact right right, right. okay thanks we okay uh, so if you could all in your in your chat chat windows uh, i'll i'll give you four options uh, how would you describe this picture not at all evocative somewhat evocative uh very evocative three options if you could all all put it in your chat uh what is your reaction uh, to this to this picture does it evoke emotions not at all evocative somewhat evocative very evocative okay so it's reasonable to say that uh uh opinion is pretty much divided here some people find it okay there some are okay with it some people don't find anything of merit in this uh a next image is this so if you look at this image uh what do you feel again uh show of hands and uh you could talk just tell me what is what is the feeling uh 
that this picture is evocated. Vitya, can you can you please uh, go ahead? Yeah, I don't have much to add. Uh, I just uh, felt that the previous photo was inspired from this painting, so it's evoking the same kind of emotions. Absolutely, uh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but uh, it's both 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 evoke the same emotions in you. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. And say the intensity of the emotions. Uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, this. Uh, I mean, I have a personal uh, connection to this pa painting, so I can't say I'm a little biased about that. Okay. Why do you have a connection with this painting? Uh, I mean, I uh, saw this painting uh, a lot of. I mean, a long time back, and uh, mm -hmm. I associate life to these kind of, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Woody Allen's kind of um, idea of life, uh, romanticized. Uh, uh, Worldview. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. And you and you remember the painting from yeah. the time that you have seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From it's it's my okay. desktop wallpaper, I guess. Oh, okay. Lovely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Prashant, Prashant, can I, you please go ahead? Yeah. So for me, um, the previous uh, photograph which you have shown, it is it's somewhat similar, but the first one was very harsh, I would say, in nature. Mm -hmm. The colors, or maybe the light, or whatever you call it. But this one uh, is soothing for the eyes, I would say. Though at the same time, it is also a, a little bright, but uh, soother than the previous image. Okay, okay, okay. Can we okay. do that uh, small exercise again of uh, looking at this? Uh, how evocative is this painting for you? Uh, not at all evocative, somewhat evocative, very evocative. Please, all of you, if you can just put it in the chat. Uh, Prakul here. Again. Hi, Prakul. Yes. Yeah, Prakul. Uh, so what what I see is uh, in the previous photo I uh, couldn't see that many people maybe, but here I can see other people walking as well by mm -hmm. the road. So I feel a sense of a uh, uh, world uh, mm -hmm. in this picture that okay the people mm -hmm. are also there. So you know, how do I say it? It's a uh, uh, like we capture a village life. We have uh, you know a tree. Maybe, or, mm -hmm. Uh, so in this painting also I'm able to see those people and the vibe of that uh, place. Maybe I, I feel like it's uh, Italy or romanticized, some, some place like that because of the people and the stars and the uh, restaurant mm -hmm. or the lighting of that restaurant, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it evokes a certain emotion, a little bit added to the uh, previous image that you showed us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Can can I say something, sir? Yes, Sean. Yes, Sean. Please. Go on. Yeah. Uh, uh, I feel exactly opposite to what actually Prakul said. I somehow, uh, you know, I don't know uh, some blacks that are there in this current one versus um, what was there in the other one. Somehow, uh, the previous one looks. It gives me a lot more um, perspective about what the place is. I mean. You see the buildings are not obviously not so posh and all that, but there's still so much of quietness around it. I mean, everybody seems to be too happy. I mean, everybody is quiet. Mm -hmm. So it gives me a lot more, um, you know, like everybody's settled, you know, it, that gives me a lot more positive image than this. Uh, the previous one. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Great, thank you. So these are the two uh, two images side by side. The first is a very famous painting by Van Gogh, and uh, the second is actually uh, a photographer who has gone to that place and captured that image in the present day. So, so apart from maybe uh, Sham and uh, Prithvi, was it who didn't? Uh, uh, didn't find this way evocative. I think there was more or less a consensus uh, that the painting uh, was quite evocative and the opinion was divided on the image. Uh, I tend to find, uh, find the painting very evocative. Uh, I think it has a lot of emotionality to it. Uh, whereas the image for me is something uh, uh, something that just seems very random uh, except for the fact that it's trying to emulate uh, the composition uh, of Van Gogh. Uh, 
VTR, I think it was who who said that uh, he saw this painting uh, many years ago and has a close association with the painting. And I can I can very much understand the uh, the association that a painting and image like this can create uh, in someone's mind. Whereas I think if I were ever to see this photograph, I would uh, I would not even remember it by the end of the day, let alone by the end of the week or uh, by the end of 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 the month or a few years from now. Uh, so what I'm what I'm trying to get at is that uh, since Van Gogh is painting, he has his subject before him, but he is able to choose the elements that go into the painting, and he is able to choose the elements that he doesn't want in his paintings. So while the colors are, again, it's yellow, there's yellow and blue in, in uh, both the images. Uh, it's, it's, it's not just the colors, it's the choice of what goes into what you're creating and the choice of what you, what you want to leave out of what you are creating, uh, which creates certain certain emotions uh, i want to i want to move on to the next piece which is an introduction uh, which is a small paragraph in a book on wes anderson and this is from the introduction by michael shabon and i'm going to read it out but i'm also going to i also have it on the screen for those of you who are not able to follow me very clearly uh, you can read it from the screen as well. Just maybe mute my audio if it bothers you so much. Uh, for those of you who prefer to listen to it, here is the introduction. The world is so big, so complicated, so replete with marvels and surprises that it takes years for most people to begin to notice that it is also irretrievably broken. We call this period of research childhood. There follows a program of renewed inquiry, often involuntary, into the nature and effects of morality, entropy, heartbreak, violence, failure, cowardice, duplicity, cruelty, and grief. The researcher learns their histories and their bitter lessons by heart. Along the way, he or she discovers that the world has been broken for as long as anyone can remember and struggles to reconcile this fact with the ache of cosmic nostalgia that arises from time to time in the researcher's heart. An intimation of vanished glory, of lost wholeness, a memory of the world unbroken. Recall the moment at which the ache first arises, adolescence. The feeling haunts people all their lives. Everyone, sooner or later, gets a thorough schooling in brokenness. The question becomes, what to do with the pieces? Some people hunker atop the local pile of ruins and make do. Bedouins staining their gourds in share of shattered jams. Others set about breaking what remains of the world into bits even smaller, more jagged, kicking through the rubble like kids running through piles of leaves. And some people, passing among the scattered pieces of that great overturned jigsaw puzzle, start to pick up a piece here and a piece there with a vague yet irresistible notion that perhaps something might be done about putting the thing back together again. Two difficulties with this latest scheme at once present themselves. First of all, we have only ever glimpsed, as if through half closed lids, the picture on the lid of the jigsaw puzzle box. Second, no matter how diligent we have been about picking up pieces along the way, we will never have anywhere near enough of them to finish the job. The most we can hope to accomplish with our handful of salvaged bits. Yeah. The most we can ever wish to accomplish with our handful of salvaged bits, the bittersweet harvest of observation and experience, is to build 
a little world of our own a scale model of that mysterious original unbroken half remember of course the worlds we build out of our store of fragments can be only approximations partial and inaccurate as representations of the vanished whole that haunts us they must be accounted failures and yet in that very failure in their gaps and inaccuracies they may yet be faithful maps accurate scale models of this beautiful and broken world we call this scale models works of art so it's a rather uh, it's a rather fascinating uh, way of looking at art which also a little complicated in the way that it is put uh, i hope most of you either from listening to it or from reading uh, understood the gist of it but i am going to i am going to still try and summarize uh, what was being said what is being said is that we as as children we tend to look at the world as as a complete whole you know if we we are born in a city and we think of the city as the world itself we don't know of countries that exist elsewhere etc etc sooner or later we realize that not only the geography of the space that we are living in but uh, but also the human relationships that we that we experience around us and the emotions that we experience around us are are broken they are, they are, they are fragmented they are never complete there is there is something wrong with them and this shatters our world and most people will make do with the pieces and try to still forge ahead in life regardless of the broken world we are we as artists are not concerning ourselves necessarily uh, at least we are not those people who who just walk past the ruins of of what we once had we are those people who try and keep making try to keep making sense of of the world that we live in we try to make sense of this world by trying to put together the broken pieces you know we try and put them together to see how this pieces fit together uh and in trying to make them fit together we try and understand the world around us but what happens is this pieces never actually do fit together do they no matter how reasonably you you try to approach a certain situation there's always something that goes wrong so when you put together this pieces when you put together this trick so you see that there are many pieces missing missing but in spite of this pieces missing you get a sense of the whole and in fact it is this missing pieces in your jigsaw that are creating a certain emotion because to fill up that jigsaw to make that picture complete in your mind you you are necessarily relying on your memory whether that's physical memory or your emotional memory of things and because it evokes because that incompleteness evokes those memories uh, the picture in front of you becomes complete and therefore the incomplete picture can actually be more evocative than a very complete picture very simply what he is saying is that as a child we look at the world as something that is complete which is unbroken but of course that is not the case we look at our mom and dad we look at our brothers and sisters friends and we think that this relationships are perfect but of course that is not the case you know we all have our problems with disagreements etc and if you actually blow up this model uh, as children we realize that okay this world is actually not complete it is actually broken so when we realize that the world is broken we try to take things that we think are the pieces of the world and we try and put together the world that we remember as a child was complete is that clear so far okay. prashant yeah 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 okay now what happens is when we try to piece together this world this pieces the picture that we create is still broken because we don't have all the pieces neither do we have the power to create a perfect world right because the world never was perfect it was only us who were looking at this world as perfect 
Mm-hmm. So our attempt to create this world, this perfect world, will always be incomplete. But that in making that attempt, what we are trying to do is we are trying to create a miniature world. We are trying to take pieces that we think will create a complete picture and put them together. So that miniature world that we create, whether that be a painting, a song, a play, or a film, will always be incomplete. It will never truly reflect what we as children thought was the perfect and the complete world. Got it? Yeah, got it completely. Yeah. Yeah. So, in fact, when we try to piece together these little pieces to understand how our world gets completed, this model that we create. whatever that model is painting etc is a work of art yeah okay okay yeah. yeah and the work of art in what it leaves out actually it defines the work of art more than what it takes in or if not more more it equally define equally what is incomplete the jigsaw puzzle pieces that are not there Uh, are also as important to the uh, to the picture as the pieces that are there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Okay, great. So we are going to move on to the next slide now. Uh, what is meso sand? Uh, so all this to actually come to the point of what is meso sand. Uh, I uh, so. i asked you a question how real do you think uh, uh, do you think film should be i come from a school of thought and there are different schools of thought uh, i come from a school of thought which actually uh, prakul i uh, articulated uh, articulated in the very beginning of the session is that uh, what you decide to do uh, uh, with a work of art depends on the subject so since we are talking uh, i'm going to restrict myself to the to films here uh, before i decide how a film should be i never actually decide how films should be in general uh, but before i decide how a film should be uh, i look at the script and the script is what tells me how the how the film should be so whether it should be real whether it should be rooted in realism but with certain certain liberties or uh, whether it should be melodramatic or whether it should be completely surreal or impressionistic uh, depends on the source material that i have so this is usually my approach i also feel that that is also the most true and most honest approach uh, but people differ different people think differently uh, my uh, in my talk i'm just going to restrict myself to my thoughts so therefore what you will find is going to be a biased view of how to approach uh, approach uh, approach meso sen depending on the subject material at your hand which also means that uh, as a director i do not i do not uh, decide that i have a certain style uh, i try actually not to have any kind of style as such except that the style that a particular script dictates for a particular film uh so that's how that's how i i think uh and now to go back to the to the two images that we that we saw i think a lot of people found including uh, including myself uh, a lot of people find the painting much more evocative than actually this photograph uh the reason being uh that the painting is actually a scale model of van gogh of what van gogh would have seen at that time with his own eyes and he has he might have taken certain departures departures from uh, from what he sees uh for example he might not have seen the sky so blue he might not have seen the sky so bright with this huge stars uh, the facade of the cafe might not even be yellow in fact it's painted yellow right now for sure because van gogh has painted it yellow in his painting and if you look closely it says cafe van gogh so uh in the photo uh so this painting is actually to me very evocative 
because of the choices that it makes. The way it decides to portray the sky is is bluer than the sky or than the nighttime sky that he might have actually seen. Uh, the yellow as a bright, really lively, vibrant yellow, full of life, you know, like his sunflowers, which is perhaps not, uh, which would perhaps not be the facade of the cafe. You know, even if it would have been a yellow, it may have been a it may have been slightly paler and aged, dirty sort of a yellow. So all this 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 interplay of colors of the choice of elements that he that he decides. In fact, the very place from which he decides to view the painting, to view the subject in front of him, and then paint it, to not view it say from the balcony, not from the window of any other building. Uh, all all brings uh, a certain certain uh, schwa de vivre in this in this painting. Uh, you can see you can see the lines. You can see the different parts of the painting. There is this uh, there is this paved paved street that goes recedes right into the depth of the painting. Then one side is a bright yellow, the other side is a dark blue, uh, which again is sometimes broken by the light in the windows in the houses. And then overhead you see this bright blue sky and all of it is really giving a Poen Vivo kind of feeling. Someone mentioned uh, films of Woody Allen, especially films that he has shot in Europe like uh, like uh, Midnight in Paris and Vicky Christian uh, Barcelona. So this image actually evokes what maybe a drama that you view over two two hours with great acting, with writing, with uh, sound design, with music, etc. Evokes. Uh, so actually, this this uh, broken painting, this incomplete painting, this. Uh, subjective view of the world of Van Gogh actually evokes more in in a lot of people's minds and hearts more than more than what the actual image, the actual place place might evoke. Uh, more people, I'm sure, actually look at this painting in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam than uh, than people who actually go to ours to see this this cafe. So coming to what is Mizosen, uh, uh, any ideas guys, what is Mizosen? Yeah, uh, it includes everything we see in a frame, uh, sets, props, costume, uh, hair, makeup, acting, uh, essentially like what we see in a stage play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Why do you say a stage play? Uh, because that is how we, uh, uh, like in a theater, uh, we take care of every element uh, that is uh, in the frame, that is how uh, even in film uh, it is supposed to be. I mean, this term is inspired from theater. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, so, the usage of everything that we see in frame to enhance storytelling to be a part of uh, the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, like VTR said, that this uh, uh, term actually comes from theater. Uh, you Google Mizos and the first thing that uh, that you will uh, that you will read about Miso Sen is that it's uh, a French term which comes from theater, which literally means uh, mise means to put, uh, o means sort of in, and sen means uh, the stage or the scene. So to put in the scene. So whatever is being put in the scene is is Miso Sen. I mean that's a very uh, that's a very uh, textbook and a very literal definition of of uh, uh Vtr spoke about a few more details about uh, about Mizosen, which is great, which is what it is. Uh, I I would like to describe Mizosen, uh in different words. Here is what I say. This is what. I understand by Miso Sen. Uh, Miso Sen comprises of all the elements of filmmaking. Vitya mentioned art direction, camera, costumes, 
all the elements of filmmaking. So mise en scène comprises of all the elements of filmmaking that a director can use to enhance the audience's experience of the story. So the idea is, uh, why is mise en scène important? Mise en scène is important because it can enhance uh, the audience's reaction in in the story. Uh, I think Sham, it was right. You said uh, Sham. Did you say that uh, uh, that it should evoke emotion in me? Yes, sir, that was me. Yes. 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 Absolutely. So that is what a filmmaker is always. Uh, at least I am always attempting to do. I am trying to see what is the emotion of the script. What is the core emotion of the script? What is the emotion of the scene? How does the emotion of the scene relate to my uh, to the core emotion of my script? And what can I do to enhance it? What can I right now do in this scene when I'm taking this shot? What can I do to enhance that particular emotion and its relationship and its interplay with the overarching emotion of the story? So again, all the elements that a director can use to enhance. So first, I fix what is the what is the experience that the audience, uh, what is it that I want the experience uh, or the audience to experience through the story? Uh, is that scene? Uh, what is this scene doing to enhance that experience? And what am I doing in that scene to enhance that scene so that it can enhance the experience of the story? So everyone agrees with this definition. Do you guys have something to add, something to take out of this definition? Agree, disagree? Please. I have a doubt. Yeah. Uh, so by all elements of filmmaking, do you also mean sound design and editing, which are not exactly a part of uh, staging and the literal definition of mise en scène? Uh, yes, I mean those. Okay. I mean those. Okay. And actually, if you if you even pick up a textbook on mise en scène. Uh, it will include uh, editing and uh, and uh, sound design as uh, uh, okay, okay. elements of music. That's that's basic. But I mean everything, everything that you can do at that particular moment, right? Inclu right. Including performance. I, uh, can I add one, one more thing in this? Like, uh, it can on, uh, not only mean addition of something; it can also mean what we are not trying to show so that we are invoking an another, another emotion. Uh, Makes sense. Makes sense, Prakul. So that is what I mean, Prakul, that all the elements of filmmaking that the director can use to enhance the audience's experience of the story. Sometimes you can enhance the experience by withholding certain things, which is what we said, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, absolutely. So the thing is, uh, Mizo Sen, Usually, a lot of uh, a lot of filmmakers put a lot of uh, uh, stock by their craft, and by the craft, I mean that they consider craft to be of utmost importance uh, to a film, much more than the emotionality or or uh, or the story of the film. Uh, when that happens, what usually happens is that the story recedes in the background and uh, and the craft is very much visible but uh, when i mean so i'm going to be a little mean here and uh, i am go even going to generalize and say that generally this tendency of the directors is there because they because directors usually have big egos and uh, not usually, but a lot of them, uh, and they believe in the primacy of the director over the story. So, a lot of filmmakers, and uh, uh, I am not actually including a lot of filmmakers because they do it very well. But you can actually look at their films and say that, uh, and you can identify this craft and all the tricks that they are doing. And the moment as an audience, when you are looking at the, when you are aware of the tricks uh, that are being played, you are no longer interested in the trick. Film is like a magic show. Okay, the, the magician has to draw you in 
and by a sleight of hand produce a trick that you were not expecting and therefore evoke a certain emotion in you however imagine if the magician made his trick very explicit imagine you knew everything that he was doing to to do that magic trick how interesting would that magic trick would be i'm not going to take a show of hands but i i'm going to assume that the consensus would be that it's not a very interesting magic trick. so therefore when we are doing our tricks when we are slowly suddenly trying to see the, uh, there is a lot of emotion in if you have a good script and i i'm hoping that of course before you get to mizo sen you get to screen writing and the principles of screen writing and think about the story that you are making and create the right emotions in the story so that they can be in the film uh, so once you have emotion in the story then you only need to enhance that emotion very subtly you you don't need to highlight what you are doing to to enhance enhance that emotion uh so according to me if if you are using something that is very visible to a common audience maybe if you are a filmmaker a lot of things will be visible to you in another filmmaker's film which is fine because that's how you tend to look at films but if you tend to look at if if you are a lay audience if even let's say your best friend who is a chartered accountant can sit and say oh this guy's films are always like that you know he has this very quintin tarantino esque style then you know that the filmmaking is uh, the filmmaker is failing his film somewhere because he has decided to put the style he has decided to give more priority to the style and uh, and not to the emotion of the story yeah. anyone agree disagree more uh, more ideas on this questions anyone yeah uh, i uh, kind of uh, disagree to this uh, to an extent uh, uh-huh. because uh, i think films are uh, more than uh, just the plot uh, mm-hmm. and like okay so uh, if i'm watching let's say a david fincher or a martin scorsese film uh, i'm mm-hmm. i want to uh, be in their world like if it's a uh, crime story uh, anyone could make a crime story but david fincher would make a crime story a certain way which is why yes. I, i'd want to watch his film the smooth tilts yes. or the smooth pants uh, yes. so i think uh, a director style uh, is also part of the film and yes. uh, i think that 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 is why he is hired in the first place right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so okay yeah. uh, btr uh, i think we uh, you sort of 90% agree with me and i'll 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 tell you tell you why or actually you could tell me that why, you just said that anyone could make a crime thriller etc but you would want to watch a scorsese or a fincher film yeah yeah why, why would that be because i mean then if if style is important i mean style we all know what is right now what is the most current style which is ala mode so to speak of of uh, of shooting of uh, of making crime thrillers uh, wh- what is it in fincher uh, uh, fincher and martin scorsese's films that that actually sets uh, sets those film apart from the usual crime thriller okay uh, i'm just and you actually a- said that when you when you mm-hmm. said that mm-hmm. uh, when you uh, spoke last time you actually said what is so particular about that yeah uh, so i'm just taking an example i'm not uh, just pointing out fincher and scorsese but uh, in fincher, fair enough but let's take those examples yeah 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 okay i think so, they are very good examples to go yeah so i watched three films of fincher uh, at a at a stretch and after mm-hmm. that i found it very difficult to watch other films because mm-hmm. fincher uh, you know he his camera work and his colors are set in a particular world like yellow yes. tints and the teal blue color and the yes. camera tilts are very smooth and the pans are very smooth that mm-hmm. uh, after that when i watched the film it was so jarring and it was so annoying to me so mm-hmm. his world uh, has a certain qualities in terms of the film making and mm-hmm. i think i i got very attracted to that uh, sort of uh, style which he brings on uh, to to the film mm-hmm. yeah okay fair enough uh, what you are saying or uh, what i am understanding from what you are saying is that you that you like the world uh, uh, which he created yeah yeah absolutely and that is what i i feel every great filmmaker does i just read out uh, an introduction uh, in a book of interviews uh, of fess anderson uh if you have seen wes anderson films yeah. you can immediately see what his style is yeah yeah 
right yeah uh on i mean if you take me literally mm. uh one would say that uh wes anderson's style is more predominant over his story yeah style over substance yeah. but i i would i would say no i would say no what these filmmakers are doing you spoke of scorsese fincher uh wes anderson we refer to right now uh we saw a van gogh painting painting and he has a very discernible style right hmm 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 so what these people are actually doing is that they are creating a world okay okay and once you buy into a world what they are doing is they make you this world invisible okay okay if there is a certain way a story unfolds in a wes anderson movie right okay you you are a filmmaker you will look at colors etc etc but keep that aside for the moment think of the time when you were actually just aspiring to be uh, someone who knows about films hmm. you would have watched wes anderson adult and the since films and those that style would have still been prominent when you would have switched i mean when you would have just started watching the film right hmm hmm at some point in the film and i would say at a very early point in the film the filmmaker would have told you that this is my world okay 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 and you would have bought into that world okay right and after that none of that style is visible to you anymore okay so right? yeah okay hmm. so, uh, so you're saying that uh, the filmmaker should not constantly appear on the screen the style should not constantly appear on the screen throughout the film absolutely okay. absolutely okay. in fact to choose a style for the for us for a script and i wouldn't say to choose a style because it's never as direct as that but to choose a treatment for a film is one of the things that really uh, that should be on that should be one of the first three things that a filmmaker should do right 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 and thank you so much for disagreeing here mm-hmm. and bringing out this point because otherwise this point would have been right. misunderstood right that's right. that's why i feel that this sh- whatever you are doing shouldn't attract the audience's attention mm-hmm. to the use of that and wes anderson makes the most prominent use of uh, this elements fincher does it all the time mm-hmm. garanti you know who i do not greatly admire but who a lot of people admire do it or does it all the time yeah. right okay mm-hmm. uh, filmmakers that i i absolutely admire billy wilder uh, hitchcock who i like to a certain extent again have have a certain way of creating a world uh, which is very peculiar which is very particular uh, where you can see that there is if you study those films there is a deliberate choice of styles of what to put in and what not to put in but at the same time that the the world they create is so complete that the choice is never very visible after the story sort of takes over and it's unfolding in that world and the world only only uh, serves to be the background of those stories vidya yeah 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 i agree you, and you also spoke about grounding the stories in reality this yeah, is yeah, actually yeah. grounded you know like yeah, you're saying yeah. this this is absolutely what i thought about hmm. no matter how surreal you make a film or no matter how real you want to make a film you want to ground it in a certain way yeah. and in a sense mise en scene is invisible grounding right right Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Asghar Farhadi's films come to my mind when you speak about grounding the film with Mise en Scene. He takes out all the music in the film, and on, it's only the story and the acting that drives the plot. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. I'm going to move on to the next slide. The elements of of Mise en Scene. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to move on to the next to a couple of scenes that I have here, and uh, we can watch those scenes and we can actually talk about. those and we can talk about what are the elements of mise en scene that hitchcock has used to to create a certain certain style here. i'll just briefly introduce both these scenes uh the first scene this this both of the scenes are a, are from a film by uh, alfred hitchcock called uh, die lamp for murder uh in the first scene you will see the protagonist uh, vendis who has asked an acquaintance swan to come to his house on the pretext of buying his second hand car in the scene he actually blackmails him and con- blackmails him to commit the murder of his which means vendis's wife who is having an affair with someone and 
Vendis has figured out how to commit that murder and he's explaining it to Swan. Swan has to also agree to commit to the murder uh, and also understand how he's going to commit the murder. So that is the first scene. And the second scene is the scene of the murder itself. So if you can watch both those scenes, I want you to notice elements that Hitchcock has used to enhance the telling of the story uh, and enhance both the scenes. So how, uh, again, uh, elements Hitchcock has used to enhance the individual scenes and how those choices actually fit in uh, in the whole complete film. I would uh, really like someone who's watched both the scenes to... Yeah, I, I watched both of them. Yes, please. Go on, then we hear. Yeah, so in the first scene, uh, the element which I observed was he captures everything from the top angle uh, when he's explaining the plan. Uh, right. ev everything in the sh uh, room is shown just like a CCTV footage so that we understand the uh, geography of the room. Uh, whereas when the dramatic conversation happens, he cuts again uh, to their mid shots or to their uh, mid shots and he cuts back and forth. But when he's explaining the plan, we see it like a CCTV footage. Right. Uh, so this is what I observed in the first scene and in the second scene uh, I observed the usage of uh, music. Uh, he uses music subjectively like when the girl walks up from her bed we don't hear any music and when the tension is increasing uh, then and when he finally strangles then the music uh, blasts and uh, uh, the music is used in a subjective way to create tension. That is what I observed in the first and second scene. Right. right. Could you talk a little about uh, how the shot taking in the first scene uh, helps the second scene, or if it doesn't help the second scene. So I think uh, as per your last question, what I understood is like in the first scene itself, uh, a director has uh, given us the geography of the room, you know, so how he has to enter, how he has to perform certain uh, job. And when the next scene comes, so we as, a, as an audience knows everything, right? That there's how this, is, uh, this uh, you know, uh, act is going to take place. Okay. Okay, Prashant. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to briefly talk about uh, my impressions uh, of both the scenes. So everything that BTR, uh, Prashant and Patil said uh, made a lot of sense. Uh, if you notice, uh, Mizo Sen also includes uh, the lighting for the film and the choice in the script of at what time to stage the scene and uh, how does the house look at, at that moment. So if you see that there is a very, very clear uh, way in which both the scenes are lit. There's a very generous use of uh, source lighting, which is you can see, you can see lamps, etc. Uh, as part of the frame. In a lot of scenes, you can see the chandelier in the foreground, etc. Uh, in the very first scene, it's even though it even though both scenes are taking place at night, uh, both scenes have a very different lighting to it. Of course, one reason is why uh, is a dramatic reason. Uh, they've, they've chose, uh, there's no one in the house and she's in the bedroom, uh, so obviously this she's not going to. Uh, switch on all the lights in her house when she's going to sleep. But that also realize, please, that it's a choice by the filmmaker to put her in the, in the bedroom. Uh, so when the scene begins, so in the first scene, you actually see the house uh, well lit uh, with a lot of source lighting from the lamps. Uh, a lot, the sources are also used to foreground uh, the frames. So therefore, when Swan is at the table and then Wendis joins him, there is a there is a mid shot, mid close up of both of them with the lamp in the foreground. Uh, when Wendis is explaining how the murder should take place and the scene opens up, there is a chandelier in the foreground giving us the necessary depth uh, in the scene. And uh, on a side note here, Hitchcock. Uh, made this as an adaptation of an already existing play. But if you watch the film or if you have already watched the film, uh, he hardly spends any time outside of the house uh, in the film. This is actually a very different uh, treatment uh, of a play adaption than, most, than what most filmmakers do. Most filmmakers actually 
try and open up the space as much as they can so that the film doesn't look like an adaptation of a play so therefore they will have a scene let's say of the hero and heroine punting in you know, in the river and then coming back to the house etc etc hitchcock is actually constraining the space himself he has decided that even as a film he doesn't need to open up the space too much because all the drama that is happening is in the space and that much space is sufficient so within the space he has to create an idea of a sense of space as a whole and so the one choice that he has made is to explain the whole of the planning sequence of how the murder should take place from a couple of top angle shots for grounding the frame with the chandelier to really give us a sense of the piece then finally when the murder happens you see that he has used more directional lighting the light flowing in from the bedroom her coming inside then there is a shot which is very different he here he is using an eye level movement he is uh, the camera when grace kelly answers the phone and goes hello hello etc the camera is actually framing grace grace kelly and then it does a circular movement and it almost becomes the point of view of the to be murderer swan and then we see her strangling him and this is the way he tries to create drama the sort of the sort of tension of how the murder is going to happen with that close up the way that close up starts of grace kelly answering the phone we are expecting swan to appear behind grace kelly it doesn't she is still at the phone and then slowly slowly the camera sort of circumscribes a circle and then becomes a point of view of swan in which he enters and finally tries to strangle her etc etc so does that make sense also please please go back to the scenes or uh, try to watch this film again uh, look at the use of colors all the dull colors etc that he has used and the bottle green of of the of the of the curtains so whereas we talked about using the perspective using foregrounding the source lamps chandeliers etc uh, is creating a perspective and a depth in the image with the curtains he is actually killing off the depth and he is using those curtains to actually frame the murder scene or the reactions the the interplay of the characters that is that is taking place which is very very dramatic and which doesn't need any distractions so at the same time he's giving some depth to the scene but at the same time he's cutting off depth and making you concentrate on the characters when you need to look at the at their reactions so i'm going to quickly move on now to the next slide we are going to look at five or six pages from a graphic novel called dororo by osamu tezuka it's a japanese manga comic so usually it is read from top to bottom but from right to left what this means is that for example this slide you will first look at the first image which is of an old man leading uh, another cloaked character somewhere then you will come down but you will go to the right so the first image you are going to look at is the image of the thunder then the next image that you are going to look at it is the one to the left of the thunder image which is the close up of two pairs of feet walking then the shot of them walking towards a canopy and then finally a close up saying hall of hell so this is how you are going to read it i'm going to i'm going to keep uh, i'm going to keep uh, moving on to the next page uh, but i'm going to uh keep on uh, keep the slides on your screen for a sufficient number of time so please look at it notice the details uh, read it once then again look at it to get the details etc etc uh, can you can you go back again and show us the flow of how to read it like in this in this image only if you can tell in which one there is nothing you just need to look at it top down right so the first image you see the long shot of a mm -hmm. temple sort of a place 
and in the second image you see a character entering and someone the guy who was waiting at the door you know more of a close up right no oh. that's simple enough <laughs> then you are going to look at the first image of the old person leading that cloak character then you are going to go down but you are going to look at the right image first okay so you are always reading right to left okay okay simple yeah okay so we open with this huge shot of the temple and there's a man who is sort of crouched under a clock uh, as we can we can see uh even though we don't see him clearly uh i can and i'm sure most of you can make out that he's an old man who stooped over in a very supplicant sort of a way waiting for someone so you already know that he is waiting for someone important also there's rain falling and you sort of get the context of this story on on both the left and right there are this statues so if you were actually so imagine if you were actually filming this you know then you would have to decide on art direction therefore you would have to decide how the temple looks and then you would then a director would decide that why don't you hey to be two statues here but make them really huge make them overpowering so therefore this temple attendant who is waiting at the gates is dwarfed by them and give them some kind of warrior like action so we already get this feeling of impending doom or danger rain is falling we see the stairs and suddenly we see this man enter in the second shot but we don't actually see him we only see his feet so we know that this is someone very important usually what happens is when you want to introduce someone very important is one way of doing it is to introduce that person in a low angle shot so you are looking at it him from down and he's sort of dominating in the frame over you and therefore you get this feeling of him being someone very dominant or important overpowering but this is not what he has done he has actually gone low and he has the old man in the frame who we see completely but we only see the sort of the legs of of this person who has come in uh lord diago i have been waiting for you so what we know is confirmed now that he is someone important lord and he has been waiting for him now look at the choice of lighting here this is very interesting uh, because you see this roof which is in total darkness which is casting a shadow on the walls there on the panels there but very interestingly you see that the shadow sort of falls over this man in the cloak uh, sort of uh, keeping him in the shadow in the darkness whereas it doesn't really fall on the on the old man there the temple keeper uh, also see the choice of costume already notice the use of sound uh, the rain is going fsh, 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 and uh, look at the choice of costume this guy is wearing in something very non descript a uh, plain sort of white clothes with a long white beard but the other guy is wearing a robe which has a mysterious design on it which is black and white we can't really make out what it is it's some sort of wheel weapon not quite sure so notice the use of costume and how he has used that to create to add another layer of mystery apart from the framing apart from the rain falling apart from the use of light and shadow apart from the shot taking next shot there is thunder and from the thunder we cut to this two feet walking we hear the rumble of the crowd and then again we see a long shot but this time we don't see a long shot that is face which is bang on on this two men but we see it from behind entering a temple so again the mystery of the man is sort of uh, kept alive and then finally we see a close up which says all of hell and on if on that even if the artist would not have had that flash of lightning which is flash you would still have heard that thunder because he has now created that convincing world in which we are entering uh, again you take a note of editing here because someone mentioned that editing is not considered a part of mise en scene but uh, in fact it is and i would certainly consider it even if academics don't 
consider it a part of as you said because it the rhythm that is uh, given to the telling of the story by the editing is equally important uh, as the other aspects that we can see here. now you see in light there is this log of wood which is uh, which is lifted to open the doors of the hall of hell and then you see a silhouetted figure and there is a creak with which the door is open there is this again sense of impending doom danger a looming mystery with that silhouetted figure and straight away we don't cut to the shot of the hall of hell but we actually cut to some shot of the statues which because of the editing we have figured is a part of the hall of the hell and these are the statues and look at the lighting here not only are the statues in themselves very demonic and very devious and evilish but also the lighting is from the bottom so really lighting up their eyes and making making their demonic even accentuating their demonic features look at the first figure his eyeball sort of feel as if they are growing big and the third one doesn't even have eyeballs and then we cut to a longer shot we cut to the longer shot of uh, of uh, of the scene and for the first time the character is revealed after the demons are revealed so sort of he is even more important and more devious than the demons and now you for the first time have the long shot of the hall of the hell and there he is sitting with the demon sort of towering over him but the calm com calm manner in which he is sitting there on the floor uh, remember acting is also at this for me it's a part of miso san and the calm demeanor with which he is sitting there in front of all these lords who are sort of threatening him also gives a sense of power to this lord uh, diego who has entered the hall of hell and now look at the use of editing instead of continuing this dialogue in the in the long shot he has gone from close up of the demon to another shot sorry of the lord to another shot of the lord to another shot of the lord and the mouse falling the demons and finally the shot of the lord now a very important use of prop here this that this guy is asking for a for a wicked uh, sort of power from the demons and uh, he is asking the demons to answer him and in response he gets a baby mouse there is another way in which probably let's say if this is a film the director and the writer could have treated it maybe the demons could have spoken through the thunder in the skies uh, let's say that is how the scene would have been written your diego comes and talks to the statues and the statues sort of talk back and give him the power and ask for and ask for what they want in return uh, but then the director would have said that hey i mean he would have pulled the writer over and said you know what this scene is great and all and it's really telling us what we need to know about the story but it's too straight forward you know that they are both here talking so can can we do something which really tells the story so why not use a prop that tells the story and the baby mouse i mean let's say the writer or the director usually comes up with this idea that instead of them talking why don't we just have a baby mouse prop it's like a squiggly unclean mouse but it's still a baby mouse it's sort of stowed in the temple and it's as evil as the lords but it's also sort of helpless and it's going to die and suddenly when that mouse drops it's very clear to the lord that okay they want my baby so why not i'll cut up my baby in different pieces and offer you one organ of the baby each and that will satisfy you will will it not and then with that baby mouse the scene would have been taken to another level of 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 sort of morbidity than it already is it and the statues of course respond by making sound they're clanging they're beating utensils or something to be 
the virus maybe that has taken place there. So you see them there and and he says, well, give me a sign and this door opens and you see the nature coming in, push. And you cut to a long shot. Now this, I think for a manga reader would have been the most effective part of, of the of the reading experience because he would have turned the page and all he sees is this one image of the temple and the lightning finally striking the temple. And there's so much drama that has happened inside and now we don't know what has happened. So you look at this and it's just one shot, but look at what the choice of framing at least in the manga can do to the rhythm. You will have gotten all the information that you need, but you would not have turned the page over very fast, very quickly. You would have sort of lingered on the image. You would, you would have taken in whatever that image is given to you that suddenly the sky has become totally black. And there is this spark of lightning and the thunderbolt falling over the, over the canopy of the, of the, of the roof of the canopy. And you wonder what has happened inside. And now you see in a long shot that it has struck, the roof has fallen down and it has struck the law. And the Lord has fallen, this complete darkness, while outside the rain again continues to fall. So now you are eager to turn the page. So I'm going to turn it for you, although we don't have anything here. So this is how uh, various elements have been used uh, in a manga comic, uh, which is really, I wouldn't even call a distant cousin of filmmaking. I would just call it just another stream of a audio visual sort of a narrative, more visual obviously uh, than cinema. But uh, this is how different elements have come together without you. Uh, really noticing the use of elements, but at the same time perceiving the emotion, feeling the emotion that the artist wants you to perceive in, in the story. Uh, could you talk about the black uh, screen or something like that? In the, the, the previous screen? No, 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 in this one only. Uh, uh, hmm. Just below the guy who has fallen down. Yeah, it's it's just black. It's a way of it's a way of so there is a there's a thunder which has struck who we think is our protagonist. He has fallen down. He has fallen down and immediately you want to know what is going to happen to the story now because it's all been brilliantly set up. He's going to have a child and he's going to cut him into he's going to cut up that cute little child and you know, cute little pieces and offer it to his gods. And suddenly he's been struck by the lightning. So you know what is going to happen to the story. But now is when, because he has so much, so much drama, so much suspense built up, he really doesn't want to tell you what happens next. So therefore there is a shot of complete darkness. And then when again the scene opens, you expect to know something more about the story, but no, you just come out of the temple and rain is falling. So it accentuates the suspense of the story. Uh, it just when the when the audience is crying out for the pacing to be fast, he actually makes it very slow. Okay, so that's more or less from me today. Uh, I have some readings here for you. Uh, Film Art and Introduction is a very good book on Mizosen. So anyone who's still confused or just wants a textbook view on user sign and not a subjective view that I have given to you today over a couple of hours, uh, please refer to Film Art and Introduction uh, of David Bordwell. Uh, Making Movies is another very simple book by Sidney Lumet. So if you haven't read it already, please read it. If you found the section on manga interesting or something that you would like to explore on your own, then you could try and read different mangas. Understanding comics is a is a fantastic book for anyone who not only wants to understand the language of graphic novels, but also wants to understand the language of films and music uh, saying. Having said that, it is it is something that requires patience. Uh, so it's not it's not as easy a read as say making movies is, but it's something that will really uh, 
deepen your perspective on filmmaking creative uh, incorporated is a book by the chairman of pixar uh, was written about how he founded uh, pixar and uh, the work culture there and it's a wonderful book for anyone who is looking for something uh, life affirming right now in this sad times and finally there is this book uh, in the company of a poet which is a book uh, which has interviews of gulzar by nasreen munir kabir and gulzar talks very freely about his cinema and uh, and it's a wonderful leisurely read so if someone's interested in his work and what he has to say about cinema uh, please pick up that book so on that note okay finally uh, anyone who wants to take questions uh, someone ask me to switch on the video so i have now uh, uh, sir you told you asked me to remind you about uh, directors popping up uh, in the film ah uh, directors popping up in the film is that a question that will okay will the answer really help you uh, yeah i mean yeah because i'm trying to figure out what uh, you're trying mm-hmm. to say exactly mm-hmm. so to be slightly unfair to bansali bansali is uh, one person uh, although he has made it his trademark so now most people go in to go into the cinema to look at the costumes and to look at the sets and not actually to experience the film so in that actually he has succeeded in making a uh, uh, making his the primacy of his craft the main point of the film uh, but for me sometimes he has had some wonderful uh, texts to work with like romeo and juliet and uh, all of those have somehow been uh, just uh, uh, they have just been overshadowed by his craft which doesn't even add authenticity i don't think it even adds historical authenticity to the work that he does so that's okay. a slightly unfair uh, criticism uh, but that's one uh, okay but uh, okay what's your take on otter theory uh so when i was introduced to it i uh, i was quite taken in by it it's like uh, before i went to fdi my only exposure to some kind of writing in cinema was uh daughter theory uh i would say that uh, some filmmakers i really appreciate uh, filmmakers like uh, uh François Truffaut and uh, then there are filmmakers like uh, uh Jean-Luc Godard uh, mm-hmm. who who again like this scene you know uh, in breathless is very very celebrated but it's also somewhere where you see uh, the filmmaker right in the front right so so i think all these theories are uh, nice to understand the craft uh, but finally i suppose you are making choices and my choice is always uh, for me to uh, to not be visible okay or for the director to not be visible okay i uh, want to ask a question it's actually yes. uh, myth i think so Uh, so i've heard uh, it's actually a myth uh, they say that uh, uh, theater is a uh, medium for actors and uh, cinema is a medium for directors and uh, uh, tv content or uh, series are the uh, medium for writers so what's your take on that i never heard about tv content being a medium for writers oh uh, so i'll keep the writer director question aside because honestly uh, i have written all the films that i have directed so therefore i am the writer director so i have never actually uh, experienced film making from the perspective of only a writer so i i having god uh, been having acted on theater uh, which i used to do during college time because i didn't have any other option uh and uh, having directed the uh, films i do feel that uh, the director is pretty powerless in a, in a uh, on stage uh, but he has lots of elements and actually he has the entire arsenal of mise en scene that we spoke about uh, at his disposal in uh, in filmmaking 
so there is a lot that he can do with a performance apart from the performance itself so uh, in fact like i said i always believe acting to be a part of musa sen and i believe it i believe it's the most important part uh, but if for some reason you have an actor who is not able to deliver there are still ways and means to actually build up his performance and uh, and uh, and create a convincing performance out of it in fact i have had an experience where i have had an actor who on location although he was a fantastic professional could not deliver uh, what i wanted from him uh, or on par with the other actors uh, and yet when we edited the film and showed it to people uh, he was always pointed out and said hey that guy is really bad and this is a film uh, so uh, so yeah i mean i really do feel that way about the writer medium see i don't think tv series and this are all a writers medium uh, not really uh, i mean or they are not the only medium that is the writers i feel cinema is very much a writers medium uh, having said that uh, there is this one anecdote about billy wilder who is one of the best writers and directors and the best writer director uh he was a writer for a long time in a hollywood studio and he wrote a scene and a wonderful scene uh and he gave it to the director and the director said hey this doesn't make sense because in that scene the guy was talking to a cockroach uh so he says why would a guy talk to a cockroach anyway so he scrapped that scene and wilder was enraged and he said okay you don't understand what filmmaking is and he started directing his own films so in a sense he got he experienced uh, he could only have control over his filmmaking as a director not as a writer so maybe as a writer you have less control over filmmaking I and mean, that's that could be a way of looking at it thank you okay great so i think we are done thank you so much for your okay. patience in the end yeah thank you thank you thank bye you bye. so much